I love a good story. Stories have a way of informing us of things that simply telling us we wouldn't listen to. We find stories in the books and TV shows, in movies that we love, and they contain in them a kernel of truth that we need to hear. Jesus was a master storyteller. The stories that Jesus told we call parables. Parables are these kind of underhanded ways of getting to our hearts. If Jesus simply gave us commandments, we might not listen. But the stories, the parables, they cause us to ask ourselves, where do we find ourselves in the story that Jesus is telling? Over the next four weeks, Pastor Sarah and I are going to share with you some of the parables of Jesus that he told in the temple in between Palm Sunday and Good Friday. This morning's parable is a parable that Jesus told to the Pharisees who were there questioning him, questioning his authority. We're going to be reading from the book of Matthew, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 33 through 46. And as we read this together, listen for what the word of God is saying to you in your lives this morning. Hear now the word of the Lord. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. And when the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again, he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard, and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They... The Pharisees said to him, He will put those wretches in a, to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they realized that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is the word of the Lord. What would you call this parable? We were talking it over in the office this week. The heading of this is the parable of the wicked tenants. That's what we went with for the sermon title today. But we also agreed it could have been called the parable of the stupid stewards. Jesus says that there is a landowner who has a vineyard, builds a wine press, a great tower, has this majestic Napa Valley kind of situation going on. If you've ever been to Napa, you know it's gorgeous, right? These vineyards headed up the mountains, and these beautiful tasting rooms and this idyllic scenery. 
One of my favorites had this garden where you could sip your wine and there was like a dog running around. Like that's almost heaven, right? So the owner builds this beautiful place and then he goes off to another country, maybe to do the same thing somewhere else. And he leaves stewards behind to care for things while he's gone. And when it comes time for the harvest, the owner wants the produce, he wants his grapes, he wants his wine. And so he sends other servants to collect it. But when those who have been put in charge see the servants coming, they beat one, they kill another, and they stone a third. And so the landowner, he sends more. And every one that he sends has the same thing happen to them. And finally the landowner says, I'll send my son because my son has some authority. They'll listen to my son. And the stewards, when they see the son coming, they say to themselves, this one is the heir. If we kill him, then all of this becomes ours permanently. That's not how inheritance works. How dumb could you be? But that's what they do. And so Jesus says to those who he's telling the story to, the chief priests, the Pharisees, the religious leaders there in the temple, what do you think the landowner will do? And they say, well, that's easy. He's not going to give the vineyards and the farm to these folks. No. He's going to take those And the word here in Greek is great. Those evilly evil ones, an intensification of evil here. These folks are so bad that he's going to kill them. And then he's going to bring in others who will do the right thing. And Jesus says, interesting. You've all just condemned yourselves. Congratulations. If you don't change your ways, this inheritance that you've been given to lead the people of God is going to be taken from you and others will be brought in who will steward things the right way. There's one thing that endures in Jesus' story, regardless who is taking care of it. And that is the farm, the winery. The tower still stands, the vines still produce grapes, there is still a harvest. And that harvest might be called the kingdom of God. The question is, who's going to be in charge? Who is going to steward this harvest until the owner comes again. And the Pharisees and the chief priests, all of a sudden, they get smart. And they realize that these parables have been told against them. Wow. And they want to arrest Jesus, and they want to kill Jesus, but they're afraid to, and why? because they're afraid of what people will think of them. Not because they have strong principles, the concept that I want us to wrestle with here this morning is a concept that I'm gonna call pseudo-repentance. It's a repentance that believes that we're not really all that bad deep down. We just do bad things. And so if from time to time we decide that we're going to do something good instead of something bad, then that we're going to be all right. The Pharisees, the chief priests, 
They're rotten to the core in this case. And why? Because they have sold out their responsibility to God in favor of the authority and power that they receive by being stooges of the Roman Empire. They claim to follow God's laws. They claim to be experts in them. And in fact, the very reason that they are questioning Jesus is because they're trying to trip him up. They're trying to make him look like a fool in front of all these people so they will stop following Jesus and instead start following them again. All throughout history, there have been people in power that have been threatened by the little guy. And so they go to extreme lengths, sometimes in the name of God, in order to keep their power and authority. My favorite example of this, I think, is Martin Luther, himself a priest in the church in the 16th century who looked at abuses of power by the church. There was a big fundraising campaign going on for the big cathedral in Rome, in the Vatican that's still there, by the way, St. Peter's. Money raised by promising people that if they just give a little bit more, their loved ones would go to heaven. Sounds like a great fundraising strategy, I don't know. And Luther looks at this and says, that's ridiculous, right? There's nothing biblical about this. And so he, in his own local church, nails 95 reasons why the church is abusing its power. And he was right. But the church saw it as a threat. And so as all good Christians do, they tried to kill him for pointing out how wrong they were. You don't want to be on the wrong side of revolution, folks. But one thing is true about those who find themselves on the wrong side of revolutions, they don't think they're wrong. The church didn't think they were wrong. The chief priests, the Pharisees, they didn't think they were wrong. That's the thing. This should be sending up warning flags for all of us as Christians living where we do today. The possibility that we could be wrong. And if that once makes you want to throw tomatoes, cans of soup, stones at me, it's a tough place to be, folks. The season of Lent is about true repentance. It's about taking a look at our lives, putting ourselves under a microscope to ask really difficult questions about whether we are really living as Jesus would call us to live. If some of the problems that we have as a a society could not be fixed, if some humility could come into our hearts, but it's challenging. It's difficult. It's difficult to get that kind of perspective within ourselves. Over these next few weeks, we're going to hear other parables in much the same vein. Jesus' ways, his stories, trying to get into our hearts, which are so often locked up tight within ourselves. So the question that we will leave this place today with is... Where in my life do I need to repent? And where have I only sort of been repenting? 
continuing to go my own way, thinking that I can take little detours here and there according to God's way. That's where most of our best intentions lead us. But the Holy Spirit that I believe is present in our midst leads us somewhere else. If we'll just slow down enough to listen. And so that's what we're going to do here for a few minutes is we're going to listen. Let's bow our heads together in prayer. Almighty God, we don't believe that we have anything in common with the chief priests and the Pharisees. But Lord, that's the kind of attitude that'll sink us. So speak to us now and in this season of Lent. Show us those places where we're following our own ways instead of your way. And break us against the stone that the builders rejected. Your son, Jesus Christ. And then reshape and reform us into his image and likeness so that we, with humility, might be ready to be leaders in your church. We pray in Jesus' name.